Hello, I'm so excited to begin to kick off our conference today uh, and so excited that you were able to join us. We're going to begin by just kicking off this conversation and I can't help but um, uh, have a conversation with you about the moment that we're in. Let me just take a moment to just make sure that everything is working on the technical side of things and that we're doing all the things that we're supposed to do. Just give us one moment, please, so we can begin to do that. Okay, great. So good news, folks. We are on and live and ready to go. So I am prepared today to begin to kick us off today. And I, as I started by saying before, I can't help but just acknowledge the moment that we are in. Clearly, we have a lot of big challenges, not only facing California, but the country. And in the spirit of renaming, right, in the spirit of thinking, be careful about our narratives, I'm going to reframe that. These are opportunities for us to, to elevate this conversation about housing in a way that we haven't been able to do uh, in a very long time. So we've got a lot of things happening, some very high stakes elections that are happening nationally, across the state and locally. We're fighting multiple sort of issues and crises in the health space and the economic space and racial justice and housing and a number of different things. And that can make us feel like we are battling for the soul of the nation. And I have to tell you, I think that we are actually. Um, and all of that may feel relatively daunting to be organizing on so many fronts for this moment. But what I can say to you is that I firmly believe in a lot of the speakers so far, especially the ones yesterday, were just so powerful in talking about the moment that we're in as folks have been talking about to stir up some literal here. What I would say is to wake up a lot of bystanders folks who've been lulled into a state of complacency because we're doing okay, right? Who, folks who didn't want to rock the boat because they feel lucky, right, to be in the housing or circumstances that they are. And I will say to you, as a person who does narrative work all across this country, uh, oftentimes talking to average everyday folks all across the country, helping to understand how they think about the world and how, to think of how they think about housing, what I can tell you this is this, people tell us all the time that they're not involved with housing issues so much because they feel quote unquote lucky to have bought a home, for example, when it was still affordable to do so in their communities, or they feel lucky because they found a place, right, that's that's reasonably priced as a rental, or they feel lucky because they had a cousin or an uncle or somebody helped them out, right, with the mortgage or the rent or whatever happened when they needed to. And so at this stage of the game, in the middle of a series of large adaptive challenges that are facing California, what I'm here to say, and I think my colleagues are here to say is, we cannot be dealing in the politics of lucky. We need our systems to operate better so that people all across the state, no matter who they are, no matter where they are from, are not left to survive on luck. You can't eat luck for dinner, right? You can't pay the rent with luck. People shouldn't have to endure odds, enduring the resilience, right, or luck to find a place to experience well-being, to experience safety, to experience stability of a home. And that's a part of what this whole segment on narrative has been about. If you listen to our speakers earlier today with Anat and our speakers just, just talking about the family albums, it's about how do we get to a place where we are not trying to be, deal in the politics of lucky. And I will say that thanks so much for uh, the housing narrative research that's happening across this country and in California, we are well on our way to being able to connect to what I see as the bystanders. I think Anat in her presentation called it for her, the persuadables, I call them the bystanders, but to connect to them powerfully around the urgency of housing. Um, and the, the usefulness of this moment is that a lot of those folks who would normally be bystanders and who would normally be feeling lucky are not so lucky anymore, right? They are facing bureaucracies and systems that have been weaponized against them. Folks who are applying for unemployment insurance and they're saying, I didn't realize it was this hard to, to do this. Why, do, why are they making it so hard to access what should be a part of a safety net? Why is it so hard to get healthcare when you don't have a job or you're not connected to a job? What about food assistance? Why is it so hard to get food? What, what's happening in our communities when, when our paychecks are smaller or gone and they're facing a housing market that is incredibly unforgiving and some of them facing the possibility for the first time of being one of those people, right? on the street because of eviction moratoriums are, are, and other temporary housing policies that are being in place right now around this moment are exactly that, they're temporary. So, so for all of the folks who are doing okay, who are, who are feeling lucky, this is a moment when many folks are not feeling so lucky anymore. And I would say not to, not, to, not to take advantage of that as an opportunity, but to say this is a chance for us to engage folks differently, to bring people to the table who haven't been at the table as much as they could before. I'd like to just say that that's the role of narrative, 
Um, Rashad Robinson at The Color of Change is one of my absolute favorite folks on narrative. I think he is probably the foremost thinker on the issue of narrative in this country today. Not only understands the way that narrative operates, but the usefulness of Rashad is the way that he understands that in the connection of how systems operate. It's not that we can go out and say anything we want to and expect that people respond. It's that you got to say the thing that not only gets people to elevate housing, but also helps them to understand how we change systems. And that skill set, those two things operating together, right, is really quite a skill. He does that better than anybody in the business today. And I will say that he defines narrative in this way. Narratives help people gain clarity, developing a strong conviction of what needs to be done about their own agency and, the, and their role in systems change. What can they do that will actually matter, that actually changes the systems that undergirds our lives? That is a powerful statement. It's not that we are talking simply because right, we want people to think that housing is great and they want them to shake their fists at the television or whatever that is. We want them to do something about it. And that requires very strategic, thoughtful work. And so that's been the work of a lot of narrative housing researchers across the country and, 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 uh, and, and in California across the state, helping to help us to connect the folks who may not have always seen their stake in our success. And that kind of opening people's eyes up to how this connects to who they are and what they are is so important. We want to say, listen, at this point in time, if you think that housing and the, and the role that housing plays is about recognizing the dignity of all people and that people should have a right to shelter, great. Come on in. We got a role for you. We got work for you to do. Come on. If you think that, that housing is simply about economic recovery and the opportunities for prosperity, great. Come on in. We need you too. If you think that this housing stuff is about well-being and community health and about what's happening in terms of socially distancing safely, great. Come on in. We got a role for you. We have work for you to do too. Some folks think this, this is about responsible management of bureaucracies and planning and community planning and land use policy. Great. Come on in. We got a role for you too. Some folks think that this is about closing the racial wealth gap. Good. It is. Come on in. If you think that this conversation about housing is about sex trafficking of young women and men, many of whom age out of foster care and have nowhere to go, and so they end up in the hands of predators because it's almost impossible to get a decent place to stay on the low wages that they're able to earn in retail and fast food. And guess what? Yup, come on in. We got a role for you. That is what this is about. If you think that this is about climate change and adaptive reuse of our resources, being thoughtful about how we are being smart about our environment, yup. Come on in. We got a role for you too. This is that that is what it's about. If you think it's about ending segregation and building a new civil rights movement in this country to reflect the fact that historically our housing systems have created and exacerbating racial segregation. But I can tell you is this. Yep. Come on in. Yeah, there's a role for you to play as well. If you think this is about schools and improving access to good schools and about jobs and improving access to good jobs. Yep. This is this is about you too. If you think this is about ingenuity and innovation of small businesses, right, all the tech entrepreneurs that started in their basements and garages and, right, and gave all that great R&D that eventually became, right, these huge companies, then yeah, we're on the same page. That's exactly what this housing conversation is about, how we create that innovative space for everybody. If you think this is about colleges and universities and their ability to recruit students and their ability to educate uh, those students to be leaders, to fuel the next generation of our, for our nation's success. That is what this conversation about. Come on. This is a move, movement for you. The only insufficient response you can have, from my vantage point, is that you simply don't see a connection between the things that you care about and housing. The important thing is that narrative opens up that door, that people see their way into issues where otherwise they wouldn't see the connection. That's why the research that we're going to talk about today, and we've been talking about for the entire day, it is important. It's about how you open up those doors. And not talked about that this morning, building that narrative big enough that people in a wide variety of issues and sectors and, and issues see themselves as directly connected to the issues that we're talking about in terms of housing. So I'm going to turn a little bit and just talk more about the, the narrative space in which, and what does that look like? Um, we've had a, a couple speakers today just talk about narrative, but I want to tell you that when I first started this work around 2012, talking about housing narrative research, there weren't many people talking about that at the time. Not many folks thought that this narrative stuff was important enough in the housing space to keep moving into. Um, at that time, I think a couple years later, we published 
uh, with the Framework Institute, but what became, I would say, the first kind of substantive housing narrative research that was published in a long time. And we talked about the narrative of individual responsibility and why that was killing our ability to get people to connect to our work. We talked about the narrative of mobility, this idea that if you can't afford someplace right, in this community, then you should simply move someplace else, how that was killing our ability to be able to connect people to housing. And we talked about issues of separate faiths and racial difference, the notion that if some people, right, those people simply were not able to make it, then there was something wrong with them, as opposed to the fact that our systems were not working to make sure that they had a place in our community. And so in that piece, we talked a lot about what happens when we're not strategic about getting people up and over those narratives, about, about carefully navigating uh, those things. What happens is that our work backfires. And I'd say that since that time, a whole field has grown up around that research. Some of the most powerful work I see being done across this country is now growing up around that body of work. Um, for the last part of, the other part of the year, I've been involved with the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California, affectionately called MPH, uh, doing some work around shifting, shifting the narrative, working with a whole group of folks across the Bay Area who are focused, right, laser focused on how you think about narrative and how it's working, right, for folks across the region and also the places where it's not, and, and talking together about how we shift that. I've been working a little bit with Housing California on the roadmap, and, and you, I know you're going to hear more about the Housing California roadmap, but, but the idea that there's a way not only to advance policy, but to do that and lift it up and frame it in a way that connects to so many of those audiences I've talked about before. I've been working a lot with the folks at United Way in LA and Enterprise Community Partners around the same issue on homelessness and how we think about how we engage folks differently. Today, you know, I'd say there's just an awful amount of array of, of research that's happening around the country in June with the help of my colleagues at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative we hosted a meeting of the top narrative researchers all across this country, a group of about 25 folks, and some of, some of which are in academic institutions, some of which are in, 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 in nonprofit organizations, some of which are in for-profit organizations, but all of these folks across the country talking about the power of narrative to change the course of action housing. Folks like the Center for Media and Social Impact, um, who are looking powerfully at popular culture and how homelessness shows up in our sitcoms, in our popular culture, and the shows we watch, and HBO, and all these kinds, and how that shapes people's thinking. How important is that? It's not just the formal way that we communicate, but also the popular culture. We consume a lot of what happens there. Um, we've been working with, the, or had a conversation with the Urban Displacement Project at Berkeley, which is talking about the narratives of displacement and climate change and how you communicate about what's happening, that this displacement is a huge issue and we're not giving it the full benefit of what's actually happening and how do we change those narratives. Or folks like, you know, the Berkeley Media Studies Group uh, that has done so much just research around how we talk about health in the context of housing and vice versa, COVID-19. So I won't go through the long list. I mean, there are a long list of organizations who are doing some really powerful work uh, with the partnership of the Champ Zuckerberg Initiative, we've been working to, to think through how we make that bounty of research available to the field because it is really powerful. So I would say that from my vantage point, I am incredibly honored to be passing the, the torch a little bit today and then talking a little bit more about the specific work that, that CZI or Chan Zuckerberg uh, Initiative has been undergoing. It is one of the most exciting, I think, narrative housing narrative projects I think happening in the country right now. I think um, uh, it, it's innovative, and I think bringing a strong sort of audience segmentation lens to a look across the state, of the state of California, and really bringing data that should be empowering us about how we engage a wide range of folks that are in community. This work is well underway, and I encourage you to listen closely because it represents an important and meaningful body of housing narrative uh, research that you will have access to very shortly. So I'm going to uh, just take a moment and pass it over to my colleague, uh, Kyle Block, who is a research manager at Gradient Metrics, who's been working with Chad Zuckerberg on their work, uh, and then followed uh, by Holly Minch, who's doing some work around um, uh, light, the Lightbox Creative. So I'm gonna stop now and uh, uh, switch gears. Kyle? Great, thank you so much, Dr. T, for that very, very generous introduction. Um, it's a tough act to follow, and I hope to sort of do justice um, to the importance of narrative work and bringing the research that we have been investing in over the past 
gosh, what is it, nine months now um, to really help us better understand the narratives that currently exist in the state of California and where we hope to really push them, um, kind of in the words of Rashad, to really make those dinner table conversations consistent, vivacious, and also understand the differences that exist among those conversations, but still recognize that there is potential. We want everyone at the dinner table talking about this issue. And that's exactly what we're trying to understand with this research. What are the narratives that currently exist with regard to housing research? And how can we identify a broad but deep narrative frame that appeals to the most Californians as possible, but in very specific ways that speaks to their mindset, their paradigm toward the issue, or their, their narrative frame, frankly, toward the issue of housing reform. So today I'm gonna to walk us through some of the research that we've done to date. Uh, bear with me as I try and get the slides to work. Great. Um, and um, I hope this is engaging, interesting. Of course, please comment. This is the first time we've shared this, um, this widely, so would love some feedback from all of the experts in our virtual room today. Um, and I should just say briefly, my name is Kyle Block. I'm with Gradient Metrics. We've been a long-term research partner of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, of course, with understanding the issue of housing across California, but also in other very important issue areas that CZI cares about, like immigration, education reform, and criminal justice reform. So we've taken a lot of the best practices from other issue areas to really apply this to housing affordability in California. Um, so as Dr. T mentioned, we're really trying to understand what are the narratives that currently exist, um, how are they different from one another, and then how can we move the audience and that we've defined in a constructive way um, toward in service of getting the, you know, as many people as we can to talk about and care about housing affordability through a constructive narrative. So how do we do this? Before we even start thinking about narrative, we realize we need to understand our audience. California is an incredibly, a wonderfully diverse state. Um, and we didn't necessarily think it was constructive, like many campaigns before us, to think of our audience as for us or against us. We know that there's, like Dr. T said, different ways of thinking about the same issue. And we want everyone at the table, but we needed to understand what those narrative frames were so that we can develop a frame structure and messaging assets that speak to that narrative and not have to make the tough choice between um, deciding if a segment is in our target or what we need to quote unquote neutralize. That's not a word we want to be used. And we want everyone at the table talking about housing affordability and how we can solve this crisis. So we designed an audience segmentation which is a, a fairly new novel way to understand the values-based mindsets that exist among California voters around the issue of housing affordability. Um, again, that gets beyond that kind of tripartite, activate, persuade, neutralization tri um, categorization. We want more than that. We want to understand the underlying values and paradigms. Furthermore, we want to get beyond just understanding our audience in terms of demographics. You all know California is an incredibly diverse state and from previous audience segmentation research, um, we found that in many cases, demographics are not good predictors of what you believe. They don't necessarily tell you how you feel about housing affordability. Um, so we wanna really get beyond that, um, frankly, very sort of top-down understanding of an issue and not um, associate demographics with a mindset and a narrative frame and assume that people believe that. So we were able to develop profiles or segments of California voters that share similar characteristics and values um, toward the issue of housing affordability so that those of you who are listening today, housing advocates, um, affordable housing developers, understand what mindsets exist and how they could be or should be speaking to them in a narrative frame that is understandable and that they're familiar with. And so that is a really, really valuable because we don't have to consider neutralization. We can get everybody at the table. Um, and so that's what we, are, we set out to do. So we started with, at the end of 2019, um, redefining our audience. So I'm gonna focus the bulk of my time today on uh, bringing the audience to life. We found five really different mindset-based segments um, that I'll explain to you shortly. 
Um, and then I'll explain a little bit how we're taking our understanding of those mindsets and developing narrative frames that we're going to test through a very robust experiment statewide to ultimately land at a, a playbook of sorts to really give the field, all of you, um, a, a narrative framework and messaging assets that we have tested um, so you can connect with the segments, the mindsets, the audience that is most critical to your jurisdiction. So how do we put together these values-based mindsets? Um, it's a little bit of a sausage-making process, um, but what we ended up doing was um, started with a lot of qualitative listening, a lot of desk research, a lot of research has been done um, by Dr. T, by the Framework Institute, by so many others to really kind of get a pulse on the different values that could exist. And so we developed a set of approximately 75 value statements. Um, some of them I've listed here um, and asked a representative sample of Californians to what extent each of these statements, again, there were 75 of them, um, sort of describe them and their worldview. And these were intentionally designed to be a little provocative, a little polarizing, because what we actually wanted to do was to pull our audience apart. And we want to know where those clusters exist. We're not trying to find actually broad agreement. We want to find clustered agreement. And it worked really well. So this tells us a lot about, um, you know, uh, kind of values and less about policy, but it really gets more into the intrinsic mindset that these California segments have. Um, so some of these are, like I said, intentionally provocative. I prefer to live in a community of people that are similar to me. Some Californians very much describe them. Others, absolutely not. Um, uh, there's pretty big differences on the role that the government should play in addressing the affordable housing crisis. There's a really big difference among Californians with regard to, um, as Dr. T mentioned earlier, the, the individual choice narrative. If you are living on the streets, it's your personal responsibility. Some people very much agree with that. Others think it's absolutely untrue. And these are the values-based statements that really allowed us to pull the audience apart into meaningful but similar clusters of mindsets. Um, so here's a very quick uh, primer on the five mindsets that ultimately emerged. Um, I'm going to go through each of these right now really quickly, just so you can get a little taste of who they are, what they think, what keeps them up at night, and then we'll do a deep dive into each one. Um, and I'd love to make this as interactive as it can be given our virtual forum here. So if you think as I go through each of these segments, you maybe know somebody who maybe resembles this segment, put a plus one or I know that person in the chat, maybe tell us a little more about what you think they think about that issue of affordable housing or if you have a question that you'd like to sort of rhetorically post to them, would love to just have a little conversation around um, how real and relatable these segments are. Um, so here's the five. Um, they're ordered, um, at least on my screen, from left to right, in order of support, we assume, for housing reform and elevating the issue of housing affordability. Um, so frankly, where those of us in the room think it should be. So on um, my left, we have the, the rugged individualist. This is about um, 25, about a quarter of the California voting population. Rugged individualists, if you were to sort of sit next to them on a bus or maybe bump into them like in a TSA line and the issue of housing affordability came up, they would say, look, housing, security and other you know, achievements in life, it's all earned. You need to earn it. You, it's the bootstrap narrative. It's every person for themselves. If I made it, anybody else can make it. That's the rugged individualist. The American Dreamer constitutes about 17% of California voters. They, they still do very much um, believe in the, the standard notion of the American dream. Um, they very much value hard work, kind of buckle down, and they have a strong community appreciation. So there is like a very clear notion that communities are critical parts of the housing ecosystem. They're a little less individualistic than the rugged individualist. The pro-government pragmatists, um, pretty small here, 14%. They, they also do very much believe in the, the importance of hard work as a means to achieving housing security. However, they do recognize that there are systemic differences or complications rather that 
prohibit or make it much more difficult for many people to achieve housing security. And for those individuals and those communities, they're okay with some government help, some targeted assistance. Um, they do believe truly that everyone deserves somewhere to live. And if you're not able to provide that on your own, some government assistance is very much welcomed and appreciated from their perspective. The dream disruptors are the smallest segment at 13%, and they're sort of over the standard American dream. They don't see it happening. They find that it's a holdover from previous eras where the norms of that time are no longer true. And frankly, it's time for a new system, a new form of operating, and a new form of social organizing that is very different than what uh, we may have inherited from previous generations. And equity enthusiasts, I'm proud to say, are the same size as the rugged individuals. So we have a little bit of anchored polarization here, but they're more than a quarter. Um, and really good news here, we've actually seen the size of the segment increase dramatically um, in the past six months. So that's really good. Equity enthusiasts, as their name suggests, think everyone should have a, a decent place to live. It is a human right. Um, and that we are all better off by looking after those um, who are less fortunate. So um, it's the responsibility truly of those who do have the means to make sure that those who don't are still able to have a fair shot at life, hence the name equity enthusiast. So these are the five. We're gonna learn a little bit more about them as we go on. And again, if, you, if you've met one of these segments before, maybe they're your neighbors, maybe it's you, maybe it's a family member, give us a plus one in the chat and tell us a little bit more about the this segment and some questions that you may have about them um, so let's learn a little bit more about the rugged individualists again there are more than a quarter of california voters they they do believe housing is a privilege it is not a right um, they're one of the segments that believe look if if the housing costs are beyond your means either get another job pay more or move to more to a more affordable area. Um, so they do have a, a pretty solid zero sum mindset, um, at least with regard to housing. Um, they're very much opposed to government intervention and see home ownership as a critical way to generate wealth, but as a part of that zero sum mindset, um, they would say it's not possible for everyone to be able to own a home and generate wealth. It's for those who work hard um, and are able to make that happen. Uh, they do not place much value on diversity, and by that I mean living among a diverse community. That's just not an important value driver for them. Um, but they do prefer to live in close-knit but homogenous communities, people who share similar values and look similar to them. Um, the issue of affordable housing is really not a pressing one for them. And in, in by that I mean they don't think it's their responsibility um, or, or anybody's responsibility, frankly, to provide affordable housing for those who need it. Um, in the uh, kind of individualistic nature of their mindset, they would consider individuals who are unhoused or living on the street um, to have essentially have chosen that life and they just made bad choices and they're suffering the consequences of that. Um, and I think you can all see where this is going. They definitely value individualism over collectivism. So, Started off with a segment that may not necessarily be on our side right now, but let's take Dr. T's charge to heart here and bring everyone to the table. And that's why we're investing in this research because they can be at the table too. They have a perspective on affordable housing. We just need to find the way to bring them to the table and to speak to them in terms that they value and appreciate. And that's what this next phase of the study is, is set out to do. So it may seem a little dark to start with, but there's actually a lot of hope here. I'd like to introduce you to the American Dreamers. Our American Dreamers, they do think housing should be earned. They wouldn't necessarily classify it as a right. It's a bit more of a privilege. Um, when they see someone who lives in an expensive home or maybe they purchased one their, themselves, they see that's a sign of success. That person worked really hard. That family deserves that expensive home. Um, and that's something to be congratulated. I don't, they don't necessarily see that as problematic. Um, they do have very, very insular communities. So like very um, yeah, community driven, it's very important to them. Um, that said, they're ultimately kind of in it for themselves. So they're gonna protect their, their own homestead, um, 
but do like to have family and close um, <clears throat> friends living nearby to just have um, a little more common reference. Uh, they're, they're a little less comfortable living among diverse communities. Um, so that, you know, that's not too terribly different from the rugged individualist. Um, they're, they're pretty disappointed when neighborhoods change. Neighborhood change and gentrification is not something they really appreciate. They, they think that you know, those who were there originally should um, kind of stay with the neighborhood and the neighborhood shouldn't change. Um, it's sort of the neighborhood belongs to the original residents, if you will. Um, so that's kind of their paradigm of gentrification, neighborhood change. Um, and they're just frankly a little bit unsure what role, if any, the government has in creating affordable housing. They, they don't have a, a clear grasp on what the government could even do to solve this crisis. And that's actually a very common theme we see among more of our individualist minded segments. Um, although the problem may be persistent, there's a, frankly, a, this is very much in line with Rashad's thinking, we, there's a very clear disconnect between the issue and what to do about it. And I've, it's very um, clear with the issue of affordable housing. And I'll, I'll show you some data to back that up. Um, I'd like to introduce you next to our pro-government pragmatists. So they're a little bit middle of the road as far as um, their view on housing, housing being a privilege or a right. Uh, they kind of go both ways on that. But deep down, they really think everyone should have a decent place to live and would would unequivocally recognize that that is not true right now. So there's a problem to be solved. And that's where we kind of start to see a divergence from the rugged individuals and dream disruptors. The pro-government pragmatists are saying, we've got a problem, something needs to be done. And who's responsible? They're open to the government. Like I mentioned earlier, some targeted government assistance is welcomed um, so that everyone does have affordable and safe housing. Um, so you can kind of see where the narrative is shifting a little bit more towards a proactive kind of an exogenous intervention. And we'll see even more of that as we get into the last two segments. Um, they value a close-knit community. Diversity, so we're starting to see a shift here, is very important to them, both uh, kind of just generally and in the communities in which they live. Um, and this is really important. They would be proud to say, I live in a community with affordable housing, with a mix of people from all income levels. Um, that's a really encouraging value, and you know, we want to develop messaging that targets that and, and appreciates that. Um, that said, they're still very price sensitive, um, like many Californians, so would choose to live in a neighborhood that was further away from their job so that they could afford a home. So they still place a lot of value in, in the home as a, um, you know, both um, kind of assets, but also um, sense of community. And here's the really big shift is they do prioritize collective thinking over more individualistic. And our dream disruptors, um, they're very supportive of most housing reform, but um, they find the current housing market to be completely broken. And they would say the same of housing policy. Um, so for, for dream disruptors, these are the ones who are say those that legacy notion of home ownership and the white picket fence and accruing we accumulating wealth through your house, they think it's all nonsense and they don't want, they don't buy into it. Um, so property values, home ownership, this is not a narrative frame that's going to appeal to them. Um, they think housing is a right. They envision a future where everyone has a decent place to live, but they also think that the system is giving a little too much housing to some people. So they want more of a, a equitable distribution of housing um, and you know the the penthouses and the second homes are going to be a target for dream disruptors. So that could be an angle in which to engage dream disruptors through a narrative or messaging frame. And I think this will not be a surprise to most of you now that you're getting to know them a little bit more. They don't think that Americans should be able to achieve financial security without owning a home. There should be some other means of achieving financial success, if you will, that doesn't include home ownership. Um, they're open to change, open to new experiences. Um, neighborhood change is not something that is, uh, you know, frankly, a large concern to theirs. And they think neighborhoods and um, individuals sort of just need to be adaptive, um, generally, um, and particularly with neighborhoods. 
And we'll close with um, an, an introduction to equity enthusiasts. So as I mentioned, the size of the equity enthusiast mindset has increased quite dramatically in the past six months. Um, you know, we think the sort of events of this summer and the importance of racial justice and systemic um, racism and, you know, bureaucratic difficulties are finally maybe coming to the fore. Um, so we're seeing more equity enthusiasts, which is, equity enthusiasts, which is really exciting. Um, so they believe, of course, that everyone has a right to a home. They're very supportive of housing um, reform, particularly kind of a heavy government hand in, in building affordable housing. Um, but unlike dream disruptors, they actually do see value in homeownership, which is really interesting. And they think everyone should have a chance to own a home. So that's an interesting difference between the two. Homeownership is a good thing and everyone should have a chance to do it. Um, they really are collectivist to their core. Um, they think those with sort of more means than they need should help those who need it. Um, they, they want um, a redistributive, um, they have a redistributive vein in them, absolutely. So they're very pro-government intervention, um, very pro-community involvement, listening. If you are gonna build affordable housing, the community has to be involved in that conversation. Um, and they are very opposed to the free market determining who can live where. They think there has to be some kind of higher order to determine what kind of housing needs to be built and where to fit the societal demand, not the market definition of demand. Um, so those are the five segments that emerged. I think you can agree they're all very different, um, but capture uh, a, an incredible array of narratives and ways about thinking about housing affordability in the state of California that we think is an opportunity to meet them where they are, to bring them to the table in ways that they understand. But I wanna really just pause for a second on that notion, just to size up how much of an opportunity there truly is. So we asked, um, again, a national representative, re representative sample of Californians, um, how important 17 different issues are from healthcare, poverty, homelessness, climate change, access to healthy food, um, and through a trade-off experiment, which makes, you have to make a trade-off here, we found that every single segment places the issue of housing affordability in their top two most important issues. I have never seen this in any other issue. In immigration, for example, it's highly polarized. Some place the issue of immigration at the very top. For other segments, it's at the very bottom. Um, education reform. I mean, the list goes on. I, I've never seen a mindset-based segmentation where the issue is highly salient for every single mindset. This is fantastic news because it's incredibly important to every segment. Our challenge here is we need to connect this importance and awareness of the issue to systemic problems, as Dr. T mentioned. And this is where narrative change is going to be incredibly helpful. And from the mindset segmentation, we know the type of narrative that rugged individuals have toward the issue of housing affordability. We know it needs to be couched in terms of sort of some individualistic um, kind of work hard language, but we can bring them at the table by doing that. And we can encourage them to care to do more about the issue of housing affordability rather than um, sort of not inviting them to the table by neutralizing them. Um, so this is incredibly exciting to me and presents a great opportunity. Um, this here just shows you again how different these mindsets are along a host of very um, important dimensions and this is, means we've got um, a very diverse audience here that we have to message to in very diverse ways. So some of our segments are very open to kind of collective thinking. Others think, no, 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 I need to be spoken to in terms of individualism. Um, again, diversity, we saw a wide spectrum in terms of appreciation and openness to living among diverse communities um, and openness to neighborhood change. There's a lot of important messaging suggestions right here. And this is what we're gonna to use to inform narrative frames that we're going to test. So let me um, 
put a pin in that just for one second. And I just wanted to highlight a couple other really important validating points that we did qualitatively after this quantitative segmentation, um, just to make sure that what we're finding from the rugged individualist in a survey actually holds water when you get a real rugged individualist in the room. Um, and so this is just kind of some general themes that I just wanted to share for this group. We found that most Californians with the exception of rugged individualists really don't think the standard American dream is achievable anymore. That notion is no longer with us, but this is an opportunity because what we did find was that although the standard notion of the American dream may not be alive in California, there's a new California dream. And this was true across all of the segments um, where the energy, the excitement, the innovation, the diversity and the beauty of California, despite many of the state's known problems, is a huge draw and that's why Californians are Californians. They're there and that's exciting. So I think a messaging frame that really taps into that uniquely California psyche could be highly effective. Um, and we also found an interesting um, insight that if you consider a every member of a community as a puzzle piece, which was a frame we had sort of started been thinking about, um, that didn't really resonate with most of our segments with the exception of equity enthusiasts. So we found that for most segments actually, if, if you tell them that your community, every member can, in your community and business and schools and houses are a puzzle piece and they all fit together to make a beautiful puzzle, a lot of them are like, well, yeah, if you take one out, it's still my community because they feel like their communities are doing well enough and thriving in some cases without, for example, lower income housing or without healthcare because in California, it is so car dependent. We heard time and time again, just because my community doesn't have a critical puzzle piece doesn't mean my community is broken. I can just go to an adjacent community. So Dr. T and I have been talking about this a lot and it seems to be sort of a uniquely California notion, uh, but something that did surface through a lot of our qualitative validation. Um, so I don't think I need to really cover too much sort of what a narrative frame is and why it's important. I think Dr. T, teed that up perfectly. Um, and I want to explain sort of what we're going to do now. So now that we know who our audience is and that they're coming to the table, the dinner table with their families and their friends with a very different mindset toward affordable housing, we want to encourage them to keep talking about the issue, to keep thinking about the issue so that we ultimately connect the importance of that issue. As you saw, it's incredibly important to actual solutions. And it seems to me from my experience that with housing um, being a really unique issue and that it's incredibly salient, it's incredibly important across all segments, but we hear from a lot of research that folks don't know what to do about it. And this is a great opportunity for narrative. So through some additional lit review and focus groups um, and looking back at our quantitative findings, we've developed a set of five draft macro narrative frames and for every frame we're going to craft segment specific messaging that speaks to the rugged individualist and the equity enthusiast in their own terms in ways that they you know align with their paradigm but is nested within one larger macro frame um, so we've got a couple of these draft frames that we're working through with some creative talent right now um, we're thinking about testing the frame of neighborhood stability, particularly in times of COVID, um, where we think that the notion that every California has access to a safe and stable home isn't just a nice to have, it's, it's truly crucial right now, particularly as we're spending um, more and more time at home. So we think that could hold broad appeal, but again, we're testing not only the macro frame, but segment specific messaging that's nested within that macro frame. Um, we are gonna test the, the notion that the American dream is access to success, um, that you know, we really want to empower our communities um, to provide opportunity so that everyone has success. This is more of a community-oriented housing frame. As I mentioned, I think a big opportunity here is that the California dream means build what matters to you. If you want to come to California and start your own small business or go into the film industry or go into tech or run, oh, we met someone who had a, um, she was an image consultant in Hollywood. I mean, this is the beauty of California and the California dream is less about owning a traditional home with a white picket fence and more about making sure 
everyone can afford to live in communities that are vibrant, prosperous, and exciting and have a dynamic community energy. Um, we're going to test the American dream is a safe, stable home. I think this one's um, sort of well known to, to, you know, appeal to a large swath of Americans. Um, but we want to sort of benchmark this against some of these more novel frames that we're going to be testing. And then the last one that we're going to test is sort of the better together frame, that the sum is greater than its parts, that the diversity of California is um, kind of an essential element of being a Californian, and that we all contribute to that. And together, we have produced a, a better state and housing being a critical element of that building block. Um, so our plan here is to finalize the messaging, um, and we're going to develop an experiment to test all of these messaging frames and all of the segment specific messaging um, through a high quality representative survey so that ultimately come November, we'll be able to say, um, you know, frame A holds the broadest appeal across the state. It works very well across all of our segments. It doesn't, it doesn't polarize any segments. Um, and we'll be putting together a, um, a series of, you know, reports and videos and creative assets so that you, the housing advocates, can take this messaging frame and segment specific messages to use in your own messaging work, in your own campaign. Um, and so we hope this is useful and exciting, um, but what we're really trying to do is bring everyone to the table and invite them in the friendliest, most resonant terms that we can. Um, so that's exactly what we're setting out to do. So thank you so much for your interest. Uh, I look forward to entertaining any questions about what we found, the methods, how this can be applied, and what to expect through the rest of the year. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Kali. Hey everybody, I'm not sure if you're able to hear me. Um, right, right. So we don't have sound. Well, you can hear me, but you can't see me. All right, my video's on, so maybe the tech crew can help out with that. Um, but meanwhile, I will um, start to share a little bit of um, what we have going. Um, so I am, uh, my name is Holly Minch and I, hey, there I am. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Holly Minch and I am with the Lightbox Collaborative and I'm really grateful to um, Kyle and Dr. T. Bull for the overview that they've shared. And um, if, if you're anything like me, my brain is really turning with the implications and the possibilities of what this rich, rich research can do to inform communications in the field. So uh, at Lightbox Collaborative, we are a communications firm um, that works with nonprofits and advocates all over California and all over the country. And our job is to really help uh, folks like you who are doing this work on the ground in communities, think about how to take this research and put it into practice on the ground. Um, and so the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative has engaged us to, in some ways, kind of take the ball and run with it um, alongside all of you. So we're actually going to be um, working on crafting a, a learning lab wherein practitioners, advocates, community organizers, folks who are working on housing all across California can come together to learn and think about how to use this research. Um, and in fact, Kyle's last slide was perfect, right? He sort of talked about a flow of when the research is going to be digested and the messaging playbook is going to be available in November. And that's when we're going to be able to all take it and run with it to put it into practice in the field. Um, and so I actually am going to share in the chat box um, a little uh, overview of the housing narrative learning lab, which is um, coming together. It's actually going to launch in October. Um, there's a link for you. And uh, we invite you all to join us. This is you are actually this is the very first um, unveiling of this housing narrative learning lab. You are the first people to be invited to participate. Um, and we're really excited to open the door and open the conversation about how we can take all of this robust thinking 
bring all of these provocative ideas and really put them into practice in communications work for affordable housing all across California. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges that we we know is real for organizations working across the state is we, you know, as we saw, the, the issue is salient, right? Kyle showed us in the research. We know people understand this is a challenge, but uh, the work of aligning people around solutions is the work that many of you as advocates and organizers and policy thinkers, uh, it's the work that you're all doing in your communities across California. And that is the work that we want to do to, um, to help support you in taking this research and putting it into practice. Um, and so we're going to be launching this learning lab. There'll be a series of eight workshops from uh, October through February. Um, and they're going to focus on things like uh, how do you sort of put narrative to work in your organization? How do you craft messages that can carry some of these narratives? We're going to talk about how you evaluate the narrative arc that your organization is putting out there and how you can improve it. We're going to talk about um, how you can uh, plan some of your communications for the new year come January. We're going to help you put a plan in place for your communications to integrate and move this narrative forward. Um, we'll also be digging deep into the research come the new year and really putting it uh, into practice. So those are those are some of the topics we're going to cover. We're super excited to invite all of you to join us. And in addition to the overview that I dropped into the chat, I'm also going to give you the registration link. Um, so if you want to join this, uh, this housing narrative learning lab, uh, that's your opportunity. We really are excited to uh, learn and study alongside with all of you to take the smart research and thinking that Dr. T and Kyle have done um, and really putting it to uh, putting it into practice alongside all of you. So I hope to I hope you'll join us there. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hang around for q and I know there's some really rich conversation happening in the, the chat box and in the Q&A. Um, I think Dr. T is going to sort of facilitate us through some of the questions. Um, and I'm excited to dig deeper into the conversation. So I'll hand it over to Dr. T. Thanks so much, Holly. So I'm, I'm almost in, we have an embarrassment of riches here in terms of questions. So I'm going to get out of the way and just, uh, and just start asking some of the questions. First, let's get some of the clarifying questions just out of the way. A couple of folks uh, asking questions, just to, uh, just clarifying things. So, so one question, uh, Melinda Mountjoy just asked this question about self-reporting. Is this data self-reported or not? And she asked because she thinks that, you know, maybe some of the folks maybe said, characterize themselves in one way, and actually they are, uh, they're representing, they, they actually represent a different way of thinking about that. So um, Kyle, I think there's a really quick and easy way, a way to kind of knock that out of the way. And, and make sure that people are really, really clear about where this data is coming from. Sure, that's a great question. Um, and we did a, quite a few rounds of pre-testing to make sure we were at least trying to get away from kind of that social desirability bias. And the real benefit of the methodology here is we included 75 different statements. So you'd have to be really consistent and thorough um, to make sure we're getting kind of a, a clear segment read. Um, so. And we also corroborate that with support for, frankly, like very progressive or not housing policies. Um, so that's also where we check, like equity enthusiasts as a gut check are very, very supportive of increased production, more affordable housing, zoning, and upzoning. So I think we were able to sort of gut check that mindset with some like actual ground truth in terms of policy support too. Great, great. So, um, so lots of good substantive questions about the segments, and I would say that there are a series of them. Uh, lots of folks were curious about, they, they're struggling with this, the dream disruptor folks. They are like, who are these people? Where do these people fall? I'm like, are they collectivist? Are they individualist? Because people are having a hard time kind of placing those folks in the, in the, in the, in the you know, in that continuum of things. Um, so maybe just a couple conversations about a little bit about that, Kyle, and then I'd love to follow up because I think there's some really robust ways for us to create narratives that really get at those folks who are kind of <laughs> straddling the field here. <laughs> Kyle, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, we're sort of, you're rehashing the same conversations we've had. Um, you know, some of these are a little hard to define, and I think that's kind of a, a good thing in that they're sort of pushing our understanding of how the issue of housing affordability can and is being thought about. So the dream disruptors, I think the best way to think about them is um, 
what their parents told them, they've tossed out the window. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're anti-capitalist. I think there's still a little bit capitalist in there, but a controlled form of capitalism would probably be acceptable to them. But the unchecked form is, is dangerous and, and broken. And I think they feel like they're sort of the victims of that. Um, but you know the like specific actions that sort of they're suggested to take by buying a house and caring a lot about property values, they don't think that's what's important in life. They want a rich community where everyone can, you know, frankly, not be preoccupied with having to put a roof over their head. Um, so I would say they are much more communal in nature, um, and they frankly don't think individuals should have to be. Um, beholden to legacy financial institutions of the past. Um, but I, I do, like, it is a little bit counterintuitive because they are sort of very open to neighborhood change of different kinds. And there's a little bit of, and this is not uncommon with many segmentations, um, sort of inconsistent thinking, at least in terms of how we traditionally would define the spectrum of like capitalist versus anti-capitalist, pro-gentrification, anti-gentrification. This is what's tough to understand as a new mental model of understanding how different people think about an issue, but also gives us critical stimulus with which to engage around developing a messaging framework. So I'm sure there's a lot more discussion to be had there, but that's my initial read on how to try to think about the dream disruptors. Yeah, absolutely. And I follow up on that, Kyle, too, to just say, you know, for those of us who have been um, not only on the, on the doing work on the narrative front, but are doing deep organizing work, you know that there are always these folks who don't quite fall neatly into our categories of persuadables or opposition or, right, they just don't kind of, or our base, they, they kind of gravitate all over the place. I think Anat was talking a little bit about that this morning, this morning, these folks who are not ideologically, you know, committed in any way, shape, or form. So, so the, so of the importance of, hearing a message over and over again, the repetition is what kind of pulls them in any direction. And I think there's just enormous opportunity around that group to kind of shape, shape them because they're, they're sort of all over the place to some extent. Um, and so the, the repetition uh, of hearing our message, of, of, of diffusing our message so that it becomes the way that people think about the world could help us potentially grab some of these folks and bring them in. Um, and some of the work that I've been doing with the NPH, you know, a large part of that work from organizing perspective has been looking at those folks who, 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 would, who would consistently kind of benefit from the policy work that we're trying to do, but don't always come with a strong sense of like, you know, the strong support. And you're going, you scratch your head like, hello, you want to shake people and say, listen, <laughs> help me help you. <laughs> and so... You know, narratives are, are, if we do this well, narratives are some of the things that can help us tell the stories that help them see their stake in our success and inevitably help, help them be successful, but we've got to do that well. So I feel like this, that group of the segment is one of probably the most powerful in terms of our ability uh, to do some really strong narrative work um, across the board. So I want to just, just kick it to Holly for a second. Uh, Kyle, you've been on the research part of this, but I know Holly's going to be on the kind of training side and kind of pulling people forward. You know, this, this, this narrative space is pretty, it, 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 is, it is rich and robust with so many folks doing some really interesting stuff. But one of the challenges for those folks who are on the ground trying to do this work is there's so much they're going, oh my God, I got this paper and it's about homelessness and what's going on in public culture, and then I got this, and then I got that data. And then, so talk a little bit about, just at a high level, kind of the strategy for helping folks to make sense of the amazing array of things that are happening, not only just across the state, but even nationally. I know after our session today, there's going to be another session talking about some housing narrative research that was just published that I was, I was also involved in, that, but just kind of, you know, putting out some pretty powerful findings. So Holly, a little bit more about that would be great. Yeah, thank you. And I will say for those of you who are um, awash in resources and not quite sure how to implement it, I am here for you. Um, that's actually the work we're really trying to dive in and support you all on. I think one of the challenges, as, as Dr. T said, there's, you know, you can, you, there's uh, research papers and there's all these sort of, you know, it's, it's higher concept stuff. But for folks who are doing the work on, of, of communications on the ground, it takes a minute to sit down and really digest it and think about what it looks like in action and what are the implications for your organization. And so part of what we want to do um, is to help you kind of break that down and to really think about, okay, let me analyze my audience. Do I think I'm mostly working with equity enthusiasts? Do I think I'm mostly working with rugged individualists? Who's in my universe that I actually need to think about how they're going to 
um, respond to some of these different messaging? And how do I choose and prioritize the different messaging options that are, that are going to be published? How do I, as a, as a communicator on behalf of an organization um, that's, that's doing organizing in neighborhoods, how do I identify the different values that different folks bring to the conversation? And how do I toggle between those messaging, uh, those messages that are going to work for folks? And so I think part of the work is taking the resources and really thinking about um, the strategy of how to apply them in your own context and in your uh, with your audiences and toward your goals. So part of what we're going to do in this learning lab series is create some space and time to help you do that. Really think about how do I apply this? What's the strategy? What, what are the implications of how my organization is going to be able to put these ideas into play? And how do I maybe need to flex what I've been doing for so long? One of the things that's really hard when you get new data and you get new insights that comes out of research like this, you actually have to sort of hit pause on the way you've done it before to really take the time and space to think about how to implement new ways of connecting with your communities and new ways of um, working with with folks around you and so that's part of what we're going to try to do in this learning lab is give you some support give you some time and space um, there will be an opportunity not only to sort of have trainings and get you know get sort of the resources broken down but there's also some coaching right where we can sit down and help you think about what does this look like in practice with my organization and you know which of these ideas um, can I put into play, whether it is in, you know, the way I shape my social media or somebody in the, in the comments mentioned they're working on a video and they want to think about how these mindsets apply to the people who might watch the video. So it's really thinking about how these big concepts um, and different ways of thinking about your audiences play out in your communications tactics and products. And that's really where we're going to help you make that link is in the learning lab. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Holly, for that. And, and one of the things, one of the questions that has come up just about that was people asking, uh, can they register as individuals rather than as part of organizations? And yes, if you go to that link, you can certainly register uh, uh, for the uh, labs that uh, Holly is talking about. So I want to ask another question, and this may be for both of you, for both Kyle and Holly, and thinking about that, I certainly think a lot about this, um, but our, our, our world is changing so quickly. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> almost every day like the world around us is like you're doing a 180 like what, what's happening here um and so Kyle when you were talking about like the equity enthusiast one of the things you said was wow even in the short time that we've been working on this research we've seen that segment across the state of California kind of grow and for those of us who've been watching like events across the country it's a part of that you know if you're looking at what's happening in terms of racial justice issues and you're not singing a song about equity, listen, <laughs> we're coming for you because this is an important issue. But I, I wonder if you all would speak to that, Kyle, on the research side, like how we are we incorporating the dynamism, the quick sort of turnaround, the, the, the shifting way that this is happening across communities and how does research get at that? And then Holly, the same for you as advocates are trying to turn on a dime because what, what they were dealing with yesterday is totally different from today. Like, whoa, I, yesterday we were just trying to make a case for, you know, you know, some basic housing services from accessory dwelling units. And now today we're just trying to keep people from getting kicked out of their, you know, houses because they're facing eviction and they have to do that on a dime. So, so both of you would love to talk about just how we speak to the dynamism of the moment and help folks, you know, uh, think about this. Sure, I can um, take a first attempt at that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it has been a tumultuous year for so, so, so many reasons. Um, and one, really frankly big big benefit of this mindset segmentation is that we can just take a pulse in time very quickly relatively low cost to see if the what the prevalence of any one narrative mindset is um and from my experience i've never seen such a large change in such a short amount of time um in any other issue um so this is like a, a, just a really incredible that change of i think it was approximately 10 percent of equine equity enthusiasts from the end of 2019 to a couple months ago is incredibly significant and just speaks to how important it is to recognize that although we may commonly tell ourselves narrative is a slow game, it can change fast. And it did. And so the narrative around the lack of equity in the world had a major effect, at least in California, in changing the narrative that Californians have. So I think it's a, just a really good reminder that um, we should be measuring this on a regular basis, especially, uh, you know, I don't think we see things settling down anytime soon. So having like a really clear pulse in whatever geography or jurisdiction you're concerned about, the state, your county, your own community, it's possible to get 
a sense of the size of each of these mindsets and narratives. Um, again, quickly and at relatively low cost, so you can really see how effective um, maybe your current messaging campaign is or where you need a little more work to do. Yeah, I think the point around sort of how quickly the context can change and allow a very different conversation to take place is really well taken. I will say my observation of advocates, we work across a whole range of issues, right? Not just housing, but everything from immigration, criminal justice reform, um, you know, we're seeing um, with the context changing so fast, it's allowing new possibilities, things that we thought were going to be massive uphill battles, right? Like, like there's a whole conversation around universal basic income that's possible now that didn't seem possible at the beginning of the pandemic, right? When we saw decarceration happening more quickly because uh, you know, of the pandemic. And then we saw a whole conversation change um, around the movement for black lives during this summer of calls for increased racial justice. And, 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 and um, the emotion that is running um, hot and deep in communities across the country is allowing for a very different conversation. And I think what I'm seeing play out is that it's, it is empowering many advocates to be much bolder in their vision. Um, I think one of the things that I, um, I'm inspired by right now is seeing how many organizers and advocates are, are dreaming bigger and placing bolder demands out into the world because the conversation has changed so quickly to allow that to happen. And, and I think that's sort of the, the inspiration I'm taking from this moment right now is thinking about, do, are my solutions bold enough? Are my demands commensurate with this moment? Um, and that is an act of vision. And that is an act of, it is also an act of narrative, right? It's being able to play out if I if I'm if I'm able to put an idea out into the world, um, does it connect with people emotionally who are going to resonate with that call? Right, narrative is the work of of understanding people's emotions and connecting to it. And I think that is also the work of vision. And I think that is also the work of um, of being bold in our goals. And so I, I would say that's the biggest observation I've had about how I see advocates adapting to this moment. It's really making people ask the question: um, Is my thinking bold enough? Is my vision bold enough? Does it meet the moment? Um, and to that. me, that's a powerful question. I love that. I think that's, I think that is exactly right. It's, you know, I think none of us would have expected the kind of leaps that we're seeing being made on a whole range of issues, racial justice is just one of them, um, that, that are, that are happening, um, because of a lot, you know, a, you know, a lot of organizing from a lot of groups across the state of California and across the nation, and now realizing some of those initial goals, right? Um, but having that be realized in the moment that is representing another series of crises has been very difficult. And so not being afraid to be bold in this moment. Let's, I, I say, listen, this, this is the moment. Be bold or go home. This is, this is not a moment where we ask for a little small programs here and there. This is a time when we ask for a complete rethinking of, of narratives and the way we think about our communities. Um, it's not, you know, we're asking for things that we've been talking about kind of together. I wish we could, I wish we could get people to move away from this notion of an American dream that includes a, you know, a single family house, a white picket fence. I wish we could reimagine that. I wish we could offer, you know, a, a more a diverse array of, of communities and types of housing and, and at, different, at different price points. And then we can think about what it means to, to protect folks in the homes where they are and, and not push people out because other folks have decided that they like the area that we're, that, 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 that communities where we live. And so, you know, if this is not the moment where y'all are coming to the conversation to be bold, then, then listen, you're not coming. This is the, you're coming in the moment at the wrong time because this is the moment for that. Um, I'd also say, let me just, a couple of practical questions are coming up in the Q&A. Um, one of the is um, the percentages for each of the groups across the segment. Folks are asking a little questions about that. Um, and they're asking about the level at which we're going to break those numbers down. So will they be able to, so, th so for those of you who, who and we haven't sort of said clearly enough, all of this data is going to be made available to you across the state of California. So everybody, you know, will have this data readily available. But the question is at what level? So will it be broken down by city, by county, by zip code? How will this data be broken down so people can see the segments that are represented in the communities that they live? Good, yeah. I mean, I'm glad you're already getting to the implementation orientation here. That's really exciting. Um, so, as Dr. T said, these segments were defined at the, at the state level, um, but it's frankly pretty quick, easy, and low cost to get a, a segment sizing, as we call it, to kind of a measurement of the prevalent narrative 
in pretty much any well-populated geography. It can be a zip code, it can be a county, um, you know, a smaller state. Um, and so we have some pretty novel technologies where we can essentially send out a, a really, really, really short survey um, that's representative of said geography. And within a day or two, we can say, look, in your county, let's say, I don't know, you're really focused in San Bernardino County, 30% are rugged individualists, 40% are equity enthusiasts. You should adjust your messaging as such. Um, that's, that's pretty easy to do, um, but it does need to be done, at least at the moment, sort of on, a, on an ad hoc basis. Um, but if there's huge demand, you know, we can probably consider building out like a, a statewide tool where you can query to different geographies and see what the distribution is um, at any given time. But if there's interest there, which it sounds like there might be, uh, please make that known. Yeah, great. Um, and Eric H has got a great question for you. He's been, he was, he's been raring to get in here, so we want to get him in. He's got a, a very practical question about just the, the research on this disability population kind of struggling to find employment and housing and is asking, you know, questions about how do we ensure that people with disabilities have the access that they need to affordable housing without having to go through the red tape or the barriers, you know, and are there particular ways that this sort of segmentation analysis, analysis can be helpful on some of those very discrete kinds of policy issues? And I'm sure Eric is not alone. There are lots of folks on this call that you are dealing with very specific kinds of issues. And so right now the research is up here with the segments and you're trying to figure out how to connect these segments with the very specific things that are happening in your community and the things that you're advocating for. Um, so I wonder if you might speak to that, and probably both Kyle and Holly would love for you to speak to that, that, that you bring in the sort of research into, into connection with the real world of what people are trying to address and deal with in their communities. And it's a, to our point just a second ago, doing that in real time as they're trying to be dynamic and turn on a dime and asking for those bold solutions. Um, so Kyle, why don't we start with you just in terms of how this research will allow people to answer some real hard fast questions this particular question is about disability uh, and, and engaging disability population about not going through the red tape. Um, um, but Holly, I'm sure will also chime in on that one as well. No, that's a very important question. Thank you for raising that, Eric. Um, although we didn't specifically measure support for kind of disability assistance in, in the housing um, market, I think we can sort of surmise a little bit about you know, how some segments would perceive parts of the population that do need help, that you know, um, require some government assistance or some extra help to navigate a very bureaucratic system. Um, you know, we know that the pro-government pragmatists, for example, are very, very open to and, and want the government to get involved to help those who need it to have kind of a, a level playing field with which to kind of uh, you know, operate on. Um, so I think it gets us like just an entry point to think about some potential narrative and messaging testing um, and you know we can maybe surmise where there might be some policy support but um, you know Holly might have a, a little more of a clear answer on how to relate kind of these narrative notions and mindsets to specific policies that haven't been tested but I think we can fill in the blanks a little bit based on what we know about how these mindsets perceive these very important issues. Yeah, I think it's a matter um, not only of linking the mindsets to certain policies, but potentially to even certain policy makers, right? Understanding how the folks that you need in, to move on the issues, um, how, the, how the information, how the ideas are landing with them, right? So one of the things that really struck me, um, again, in that research slide, Kyle, that you showed, that showed how salient the issue is, right? We all know, we're all in alignment that like, this is a problem we need to solve across the state. Where we're not in alignment is on how we're gonna solve it, right? The solutions are the piece that, um, that's where the sausage gets made and that's where the, the, real, the devil is in the details. Um, and so I think understanding how your audiences are going to relate to and take in certain solutions, um, being able to toggle those solutions through their narrative mindsets actually is going to help them be more receptive, right? This idea that if I can speak to somebody um, through their narrative mindset, it's actually going to turn their ears on and it's going to help them be more open and receptive to the kinds of solutions that I'm offering. So in some ways, it's really about understanding your audience, understanding your decision makers and understanding how the use of narrative can help open up those conversations to, um, to prime people to be ready to hear the kinds of ideas and, and solutions you want to advance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so there's also a little bit of, of, of activity in the chat 
from folks really thinking about this notion of collectivist versus individual and how that is shifting across the segments. People are sort of trying to make sense of that. Folks shifting between what they see as more capitalist kinds of conversations versus those that might be more collectivist in terms of orientation and how that shifts across a trajectory. Um, and even how that, you know, how we've labeled the groups of folks saying, hey, that, that notion that folks are asking for a community where they only want people who look like them. I don't, I don't want, I don't want to hear that sort of, you know, sounding like it's something probably like American dreamers, like, we don't, <laughs> like even the label of the segments are, you know, it's like, Ugh, right. So, so first, can you all speak to just this notion of the kind of, you know, how we help people think about that trajectory of individualist versus collectivist and how it kind of differs across the segments. And then secondarily, just how the, the, the tiling of the, of the, of the different segments um, is normative in some respect. It normalizes people's viewpoints in that way. And to some, to some extent may even make that more palatable. I think there's some concern. So a little bit of discussion about that would be great. I can kick that off. Um, great, great, great topics. Um, I'll take the second question first. So yeah, I think you're, you're right. There is sort of a normative element, normalization of um, you know, some of the names that go in here. And for, I think it was the uh, American Dreamers, you know, rightfully so, that, that group um, generally isn't as comfortable living in diverse communities. And the American Dreamer, I think that is the, that is the standard American dream um, that, you know, you get your house and you're striving for that. And you, you know, the, the American dream was to sort of live in more of a homogenous community. Um, so in some ways that's sort of normalizing the existing frame. Um, that's, that's why we went with that. Like there's the American dreamers as we traditionally know them. But point is very well taken that, you know, we should tread with caution in, in kind of how we phrase and explain uh, segment in the future. Um, and the question on um, kind of the distinction across our segments between the collective versus individual, um, I think we saw a pretty clear trend and it frankly uh, felt fairly uh, as would have expected to me where the rugged individualists just really think in terms of their own self-benefit and self-interest. Um, in, in you know, their views on housing are very much aligned with that where they view housing as their way to and their right to build wealth and equity and property and it's their individual right to, to protect that. And on the other side we have the, the equity enthusiasts who have a much more redistributive um, value and think that we should be valuing the collective and, disc and at the expense of, in a zero sum way, um, the individualist notion. So I, I think that's the distinction in my mind, um, you know, yeah, the government role in housing would be, you know, much more supported, of course, by those with the collective view. Um, and, you know, I think those who hold that view would very much agree that um, the individualistic mindset is not a healthy one if we're talking about housing, particularly in um, a, a country where the housing market is not a standard functioning market also. Great. So I have another I have another question. This is a little bit of a tricky one. Maybe I'll start with you, Holly. It's a, it's a challenging one, but <laughs> I'm going to ask it anyway. It's something I, I often sort of talk about in my own work, and I, I'm always anxious to hear how other folks who think about narrative and, and having uh, uh, community organizers and community builders think about these questions, too. Um, you know, when we do polling research around some of these issues, what we're able to see initially when we start to do this work is that a lot of what can move people around some of these issues reinforces dominant narratives. And I'm saying that because I think there's a lot of conversation in the chat around that. People saying, wait a minute, if you, if you lean into this notion of whatever it is, the American dream, that, that it reinforces those dominant narratives. But it's really tough for us you know, as advocates because when we, it, that stuff tests really well. When you put that stuff in front of people, they just eat it up, right? Um, and so, you know, for, for folks who are really, really talented on the narrative front, they have to navigate that very quickly. And Nat was talking about this this morning. If you're somebody like that with really kind of sophisticated, you can figure out how to make that 
case without actually reinforcing, but it's really hard for advocates to get that nuance. And so often, you know, we go out with what we know will win in the short term, right, with those kind of frames. But in the long term, man, we just made it so hard for us. So we just reinforced all the stuff that has created this craziness that we're facing. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to that, Holly, just as somebody who works a lot with advocates on the ground and having to make strategic decisions. Like, we want to win and we want to win now. But some of this narrative shift stuff is long-term work. It's like, you know, you, you, you're trying to get the narrative in there, but it takes a while for folks to receive that. So I wonder if you could speak to that journey. I know folks on this call are probably in that space where they want to win and they want to win now <laughs> and and you know they're facing those strategic decisions i love to hear you talk about that yeah i think this is this is the question in some ways right that to me makes the difference between um between messaging and narrative right so sometimes it's you can you can say a thing that will win the day but it will lose you the the much longer battle right it will lose the arc of the conversation and so you know to the point of we want to win and we want to win now i think sometimes we have to remind ourselves of the question of like wait, what exactly do we want to win right that there is a very long arc of these conversations and we have to really think about yes there's an immediate policy or there's an immediate practice that it will be good for people and it will make a difference and we want to win that and we want to leave the door open for lots of subsequent wins and sometimes when we use a message that wins in the short term but shuts us down for the long term, we actually make our late, you know, we, we make our tomorrow's, our tomorrow's self's job a lot harder. Um, and so to me, one of the things that I think is an advantage of narrative, particularly for base building organizations or community organizing groups that are accountable to a constituency, um, narrative guarantees that your messaging has a moral backbone, right? Narrative gives your messaging a spine because it does, it asks you to take that long view about how are we moving the arc of conversation over time. Um, and, and, and not will say this all the time, um, you know, the, this notion that if your messengers, if your most important messengers, who are the folks who are directly affected, if they're not going to carry the message, it is not going to work. Um, and so to me, that's also what narrative does. It really roots you in what are the values of the community? What, what's the arc we want to travel over time? And how does this um, how does this help us do that for the long haul, right? So it's not just what do we want to win today, but what do we want to be set up to win tomorrow and next week and the day after that and the year after that, right? It really is thinking about that long haul. Um, and I think that's really hard to do when you're looking at a short-term campaign, right? When you're looking at a ballot measure where you need 50, you know, 50% plus one. Um, but the truth is we know we don't need 50% plus one to win on, on all of the everything that we care about, right? We need, we need to bring all of California along if we want to fix affordable housing. We need to bring all of our neighbors and communities along if we want to site housing in our neighborhoods and communities. And so it's really thinking about how do we, um, how do we, how do we think for the long haul? Um, in, in what we say today and how it sets us up for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I could just build off of that, it's a really great point. We don't want to compromise our ability to be successful in the future. Um, and I suppose some confusion may have come from what I said, we're going to test the kind of standard notion of the American dream. And that was intentional because we want to know, you know, how effective is, are these new frames against the status quo? Um, if, you know, I'm hoping to God, we don't find that um, the, the standard American dream frame is the most appealing. I don't think it will be, um, but that we're just using as a, a control group, essentially a benchmark to know um, how much more appealing these new frames are compared to what is most prevalent today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the uh, great, great response. It, talk a little bit about how the, this work can be useful in some of the local uh, uh lo local conversations i know you know if you're working in, and you're trying to work in alignment with folks across the state uh, as i know how you know housing california is responsible in part for working with folks all across the state and they've got to be thinking about that sort of larger messaging frame um, but in each community the policies are a little bit different and the segmentation is likely to be a little bit different so talk about the toggle between you know thinking broadly across the state and the kind of meta narrative that you create at a high level um, versus or and or uh, <laughs> or and yes and <laughs> the the messaging that has to happen at you know the different segments of geography. Kai, why don't you start us off in that and then um, and Holly? Okay, yeah, uh, great question. Um, 
And I think, you know, we've heard from a lot of different housing advocates that across the state, there might have, there has been a bit of a just disjointed narrative, a lot of different narratives, maybe I should say. Um, and so the an intent here is to show that there is one macro narrative frame that can work across the entire state that we, you know, would hope that a lot of different advocates and housing um, practitioners would use in their messaging and in a way to get more people at the table. But we also recognize it's an incredibly diverse state and that can then have segment specific messages um, to speak to specific audiences. So we know that many counties probably have a lot of rugged individualists and very few equity enthusiasts and we can size that up. But knowing that the state is using a cohesive narrative frame with segment specific messaging, um, we think will just help move the narrative in a unified collective direction without creating a lot of other competing narratives. Um, so that was our thinking there. And again, we can size these segments at pretty small geographies so you have a sense of, you know, which of the segment specific messages you could be using in your area. I think that really resonates. I think the idea that, um, you know, there is sort of this, there, there is a shared vision or a shared idea of what California can be or has the potential to be. But I know when I work with advocates across the state, you know, as a sort of a we're Bay Area based organization, you know, we'll often hear like, that's great that it works for you in San Francisco, but that message isn't going to play here in the Inland Empire. That message isn't going to play in the Central Valley. And so I think having, a, in some ways, I think the segments, the audience segments and the profiles give us a way of um, thinking a little bit more in terms of the mindset of the folks that are scattered across California, right? Communities do have different compositions and we do have to acknowledge that we're, we, yes, there's a, there's a conversation statewide, but it plays out really differently from place to place. And I think really holding those audience profiles in our mind can help us think about what's the most productive conversation I need to have right here in, in my community um, based on the mindset that folks are holding. So I think it, it, can, it can give you a set of tools in some ways to tailor what, um, to say the thing that must be said in the way it must be said where you are, <laughs> right? So, so to tailor the message in a way that's gonna work in your community. So I think it's, I th if anything, I think it will expand the toolkit, the tool set that advocates have to really um, move these ideas in their local communities. Great, great. Well, I know that so many folks on this call who've been exposed to just the description of the research are going to be terribly excited to get this very soon. Kyle, just one last question because we're closing out here. Uh, when, was, when is the research going to be made available to folks? Uh, we know that the lab is coming up. Holly, why don't you pop the link again in the chat? But uh, Kyle, when can we expect all this great knowledge and, and wisdom and insight right, to uh, power up our work? Great, I'm glad there's interest. We plan to have um, sort of a messaging playbook and guidance and assets by the end of 2020. So um, try to wrap up this year for so many reasons. <laughs> yes, and, and, and a powerful time it is because the, the, with the election cycle, <laughs> hopefully we'll be in jazz and enthusiastic at uh, what happens at the end of the year. I'm gonna wrap up and just say thank you to my co-panelists, Kyle Block and Holly Lynch. Uh, and to all the folks who are working across the state on uh, issues of narrative. This is really important uh, work and it's exciting work. Um, just to wrap up, I will say Chris Donaldson wrote in the chat uh, that uh, this is, sounds like a lot like the, the toggling people had to do in the civil rights movement. They had to be think thoughtful about the short term, but thinking about the long term, they had to be thoughtful about these larger messages, but really specific in their call to action. So that's what we're asking folks to do. So I'm gonna just queue us up for the next uh, session. It's gonna be another narrative session with a powerful national research. Uh, stay tuned for that. And with that, we are out. Thanks everybody for joining us. Bye-bye.